We've had the privilege over the last, you know, since really 2015, to travel from coast to coast, from, from California and Oregon, Florida, New York, everywhere in between, and speak in public schools and private schools and community events. And really, I always say, anywhere they let me go with my bun, I go and I talk. And it's been an honor that we've been in front of nearly a million people on one platform or another. And the last year, it's actually went international. We did schools in Sao Paulo, Brazil, schools in Tokyo, Japan, did schools in Guatemala City, Guatemala, and Hera, Zimbabwe. And, and honestly, it's been just a real humbling experience to get to live life with so many people. And honestly, the message is what I always say when I speak in communities is my story, your story, it's the story. It's really just the story of people desiring to want to belong. It's really the story of people desiring to want human connection. It's really just the story of people trying to figure out who we are and what we want to become and what we want to achieve. And we have all these pressures though. We have the pressure of the culture. We have the pressure from our peers. We have the pressure from our communities. Students have pressure of school pressures to perform. Parents have pressures of bills to pay and to take care of people. Like raising parents, out, I mean raising parents, raising children, it's probably one of the most challenging, fearful, crazy, amazing, exciting, what are we doing? Like literally as parents, we're shaping the culture of humanity because the kids, the children that we're raising, like they're going to go on and do something and that something can be good or that something can be bad. Like being entrusted to raising little people, it freaks me out. And I have two kids now. My daughter's name's Juliana. I call her Juju Bug. My son's name Ashton. His nickname's Ashton Ree. He desired he had to have a man bun like his dad. And uh, my wife's Alexis. And, and when we talk about human connection, when it's all said and done, regardless of what we portray, people just want to belong. And in the last few years, as we traveled the country, and I, I started just in Indiana, literally, this was like a grassroots movement. I started Your Life Speaks organization. And in about, two, in about 2016, I started going into public schools and one turned to 10 and 10 turned to 50 and 50 turned to 100 in Indiana. And then it went national. And since 2017, 18 and 19, we've been honored Privilege and grateful to get to work with over 750 different public schools and communities from coast to coast nearly actually almost a thousand now And it's just been a really crazy amazing journey and tonight what I want to live life with you guys about as we grow together as we can continue to empower each other is to hopefully help unpack what I've learned by experience I don't have all of this figured out by any means, shape or form there are a lot of people with like PhDs that we would call doctors that have been to school for many, many, many years that are well more probably educated. But what I have been able to do is I've been able to navigate this journey through experience. And what I have been able to do is to live life with many of these doctors, many of these really well-educated people when it comes to mental health, when it comes to substance abuse. And I've got to glean and to learn and be like a sponge. Actually, this school year, this actually this past 2019, I was able and we just finished wrapping a, a documentary on, on global mental health. We traveled all across the country, all across the world. I spoke to doctors at Cornell University and Harvard University. We spoke to doctors from Phoenix University. We spoke to thousands of students. We spoke to psychologists and psychiatrists in Zimbabwe and also in Brazil. And what we've learned more and more, more than ever, no matter where I went, because let's be honest, the stats that we just heard from our, our police chief, how in one in four, mental health is at an all-time high. Anxiety, depression, suicidal ideologies, self-harm, self-injury, drug and substance abuse, that all comes from the same place. The epidemic when we see with opiate use and prescription pills, the alcoholism that's at all time highs. But all of this really, it comes from what we try to unpack tonight is at the core of all of this, we just want to belong. 
we want to matter. And we're losing our ability to have a voice. We're losing our ability to communicate. No matter where I went in the world, no matter the leading voices, if it was Dr. Patel or Dr. Whitlock or Dr. Strotman, as they talked about mental health and self-injury or digital citizenship and the technology that's beginning to, to cause us some situations, no matter where I went across the country, across the world, mental health, anxiety, depression, substance abuse, it's at an all-time high everywhere. But everywhere that we talked and everywhere that we communicated, the, the message that rang loud and clear was our desire for human connection. I want to take you back into a little bit of my story tonight. I come from Indiana. I was raised with a family of four, mom, dad, sister, and me. My father, I share in the public schools or anywhere that I get to communicate about the relationship that I had with my father. Because growing up, he was my hero. He was this, this mentor in my life. I looked up to him. And honestly, my parents, they never had fights. They never had arguments. I was naive enough to think in my youth that I had a picture-perfect family. And what happened with my father is he would always challenge me to take control of my life. And I have all these little side stories I talk about, like him challenging me. He never let me win anything. If it was a basketball game, if it was a game of chess, if it was a game of horseshoes, if it was tic-tac-toe, like my father would always demoralize me, beat the brakes off of me because he always wanted me to know hard work works. Make good choices good things happen. And ultimately, what he was really trying to teach me was to learn when things aren't going your way, giving up is not an option. At a young age, he was trying to teach me resiliency and perseverance. And honestly, that's something that many of us in the culture today, we lack. Our roots aren't deep. The reason is, it's not anyone's fault. But the world today, it's so fast paced. The world today, we have so many things on our plate. We have school, we have work, we have society, we have the culture, we have our social life, we have technology, we have all these expectations and we find ourselves comparing and competing and what's happening is our roots aren't going as deep as what they used to. We just have more on our plate. And when we don't have a deep root system, storms and adversity can blow us over much easier. I always tell parents this, that the same struggles that many of you had when you were younger, those same issues, those same challenges, they're knocking us over as youth a little easier because our roots aren't as deep. And I have some reasons why. Because like it, love it, or leave it. The same generation that we as the adults in here grew up with, I always love it when I'm in Kansas because I can literally say we're not in Kansas anymore because the truth is the world has changed and it's never ever going to be the same. Technology is now a factor of society and it's not necessarily a bad thing, but right now we are at the very forefront of, a, of an evolution, a revolution that we will never have to face ever again. This is the first generation that students have never not, not known this thing. This is the first generation where parents have had to learn to parent with this thing. This is the first generation of teachers having to educate with this thing. This is the first generation of medical fields having to try to, to analyze and to figure social and emotional and medical issues with this thing. We're at the forefront of a technological advancement that we've never seen before. And it's not necessarily bad, and I know some of us can be critical of this, but at the end of the day, when I was speaking with Dr. Strachman in Phoenix, she said, and she has from the very forefront of the social media journey, actually all the way back when the Columbine incident happened, and they realized that there was a thing called MySpace, and that even though we didn't see it happening, their MySpace had it revealed. She knew then that this was going to be an issue, so she's dedicated her life since then to study and the challenges of the digital world. And what she said to me when I was face to face with her, she said, Nathan, listen, at the end of the day, this isn't bad, but right now we haven't quite figured out how to regulate this thing. She said, at the end of the day, 
If you look at the food pyramid chart, technology is kind of the same. At the baseline, we have the grains, the good nutrition things that we need, and then it has the milk and the vegetables and the, and, and the fruits and the sweets, and it's the whole pyramid piece, right? She said technology is kind of the same, Nathan. There's some technology that's good for us. Our ability to study, to be more connected with our, with our understanding of how the world operates. There is a place for this, but what's happening in the society right now, most of us are living on the top triangle where the sweets are, just the social media piece. And she said, I have full confidence that we're going to figure this out. And what I've learned to liken it to is that when the, the, the automobile revolution began to happen and the industrial revolution happened, when things began to change, back in the day, seat belts were a necessity. But then we realized that the vehicles were going faster and they were getting a little bit more dangerous and we had to begin to wear seat belts a little bit more often and we had to really regulate that thing. Now we can get into the car and we can go from point A to point B, and for the most part, many of us get there safely. But it had taken time. And she said, technology, it's going to be the same thing, but it's just taking time. Because truthfully, this has added another element. When, we, when the parents in here, when you were students, when you were children, you digested about a newspaper worth of content a day. The truth is today, the young people, the younger generation, and us as adults, we're digesting three to five newspapers worth of content every single day. And us as adults, we were kind of developed in those developmental stages of our early youth and adolescence. We developed perseverance. We developed resiliency. We developed some skills that today we can still handle these things. But our youth today, they don't quite have those same capabilities because the three to five new papers worth of content, it's causing short circuits. And so what that means is that we just have to continue to be effective and to be very present. And we're going to figure this out. You see, technology has added a new factor to our journey. It's just a common reality that we can't change. But we will begin to figure this out as time. We just have no data to draw from. This is the very forefront. And so we're all in this together. Parents to students, students to teachers, teachers to the medical and professional field. Like we all have to understand that we are better together. And this is a process. And I'm talking a lot about the whole the technological piece because it does factor in. You see, when we have more elements that are being added to our situation, what's happened, like I said a little bit ago, for the adults in here, you kind of had the ability to, to handle some of these storms, but the youth haven't. And see, the storms, they can, if we understand them properly, they can cause our roots to go deeper. Why tree roots go deep is because there's wind and there's adversity. But what's happening in today's society, we don't have such a great root system. So the same struggles that we as adults battled with, us as the youth, man, it's a little easier for us to give up. It's a little easier for us to kind of throw in the towel. And it almost seems like in my story, when I was a young man growing up, I was walking in a lot of the same struggles that the youth are dealing with today. Because my father, even though he was my hero, my icon, my role model, I thought I had a picture perfect family. At a young age, going into the seventh grade, my parents, they went through a divorce and it blindsided me. It honestly, it caught me so off guard. I was naive enough to think that I had a picture perfect family. And when my parents set me down and they began to reveal the separation and this divorce and my dad was ripped out of my life. Truthfully, man, it was so difficult because my parents never fought in front of me. And it didn't make any sense to me because my parents, they did what many of us as a society do. We try to mask our hurts and our pains. We try to put on this fake face. We try to suppress our struggles and we try to project and portray to everybody around us that it's all okay, even though behind the scenes, below the surface, the reality of it is, Sometimes we have issues. And for me, when my parents got divorced, well, I did what they did. I learned to do exactly what they learned to do. I learned to put on my fake face. 
I learned to walk the walk and talk the talk. And on the surface, it looked like everything was fine. But behind the mask, the hurts and the pains, the struggles, behind the mask, I was screaming, but I was silent. Behind the mask, I was struggling, but I was quiet. But I learned to do what my parents did. And that was to put on the fake face and to walk the walk and to go through the motions. And many of us, we know when we relate to that mask. Many of us know what, it, what I'm talking about, that even though on the inside there are challenges and there are issues and there are things that we are battling with, we put on this fake face and we go through the motions. See, I didn't know as a young man that it's okay to not be okay. And I didn't know as a young man that at the end of the day, we're better together. And I didn't know as a young man, like I always say, not one of us in this room, not one of us in this city, in this state, in this country, on this planet, not one person is meant to have to do this alone. No one is an island. We are better together. And at the core root of all of us, we desire human connection. But sometimes what happens is when we go through struggles, adversity, and situations, even though we long to be connected, we get rewired because trust gets broken and we develop this sense of protection. We keep everybody at an arm's reach distance. That's what I did. And the problem is when we don't speak up and speak out and be vulnerable and transparent and be honest about our stuff, the social and the emotional pressure it can build and pressure bus pipes. The number one way we as people are meant to deal with our hurts and our pains and our struggles is that we're supposed to talk, to communicate. That's what makes you and I as people different than most every other living thing on this planet is our ability to communicate at a high, sophisticated level, our ability to process feelings and emotions. And when we don't walk into that space and we suppress the social and the emotional aspect of who we are, that pressure begins to build and it won't go away. It will find dangerous and destructive ways out. And in today's situation, when we add the technological piece, this extra pressure of what social media does add, yes, I believe there's a place and a space for that stuff to be connected. But what's happening is, is we find ourselves comparing ourselves to everybody and we have these picture perfect images and we don't seem like we measure up. So we suppress and we suppress our real feelings and our pains. And the problem is, even though most of us know we should talk about our issues, and that we need to talk about our issues and we should talk about our issues. We don't because I don't know what you will do with it. And so I mask it and I suppress it. And the pressure bust pipes. How do I know? Well, my parents got divorced. I was a great straight A student, thriving, good in sports, a great personality. But behind the mask, there was a lot of pain. And I went from middle school to high school as I started comparing myself to what society says I was supposed to look like. High school, it's a time of, of development and we as students, even though a lot of times we act like we don't care, peer pressure's a real thing. We care so much what people think about us. Adults, we kind of do the same thing. We act like we don't, but many of us as adults, we care about the opinions of others. That's why a lot of times we hide some of our marital issues. We hide some of our defects and our flaws. We hide some of our insecurities because even as adults, we have a hard time being vulnerable. And for me as a student, as I was growing up in these times when I wasn't operating the number one tool of my ability to decompress my hurts and my pains, which was talking and communicating, the pressure builds. And for me in high school, there was times that I would isolate myself and the whispers would get louder. Thoughts of giving up, you're alone. Thoughts of, why don't you just quit? Nobody cares about you. And I wouldn't speak up because again, I was so scared to communicate those issues. And in high school, I battled suicidal ideologies. In high school, I battled suicidal thoughts. And in high school, at the age of 18, I climbed the ladder and there was a point in my life when I tried to take my life. See, the pressure behind the mask, one way that it will find its way out is thoughts of ending it. And we see others on TV or on the news or in the media making these choices. And so we begin to think that maybe I should too. 
Communication is the number one defense of not isolating where the whispers get louder. But a lot of us, we've lost our voice because we don't think that we can or we don't know how or what will others think about us, so we don't. Some of us, we deal with the pressure in a different way. For me, besides having thoughts of giving up, I remember there was times that I would have these anger, these hurts, these frustrations, and I couldn't control these, and I didn't know how to deal with these, and I couldn't handle these feelings. So when I felt this way, I remember there was a time that I could inflict pain and harm and injure myself because I can control this. And you know, every school that I go to across the country, I ask students these questions I asked the students, how many of you in this school, how many of you in this community, how many of you in this school here, have you heard a classmate, have you heard a friend, have you heard somebody, not you, but somebody you know, talking about or entertaining the idea of maybe having choices to end their life, to making that forever decision, and hands by the waves get raised. I asked students, how many of you do you know somebody, Do you have you heard somebody, have you seen somebody dealing with their hurts or their pains with self-injury and self-harm? And hands by the waves, no matter what city, no matter what state, no matter what country I am, hands get raised. I could even show you and prove it to you here now, adults. How many of my students in this room this school year, have you heard a classmate, have you heard a, a peer in your community talking about or entertaining the idea of giving up on life? Would you raise your hands, please? And in every school that I go to, I ask these questions. And when I begin to inspire students to know, because every hand that gets raised, raised that represents a silent struggler, that represents somebody, that hand that's raised, it represents a proxy of a heartbeat of somebody who's crying out. And when I tell the student body or the community events or wherever I'm at, I try to inspire young and old alike to understand something. Feelings are complex and complicated and difficult to deal with. And feelings can cause us to make decisions and be impulsive that aren't based in facts. Just because you feel alone, it doesn't mean you're really alone. And just because you feel isolated and you feel like nobody understands you, it doesn't mean that you really are isolated and nobody understands you. And I always ask the school body or the community event, I always say, listen, your hands will represent a beacon of hope. I'm asking you the question about you now, a general arching question. But how many of you in here, in your own story, and I inspire the students to own this question because their hand will represent Present a beacon of hope to prove to our silent strugglers that they're not alone. I get passionate. And I always ask the students, how many of you in your story, and I'll ask it tonight even to the young and the old in here, how many of you in your own personal journey, in your own personal story, have there been times in your life on a general question, you personally as a young man, a young lady, an old man, an old lady, a person in general, I'm not calling any of you old, but how many of you in your own journey have you felt alone by yourself or like nobody understands you? Would you raise your hand tonight? And see, everywhere I go, so many of us raise our hands because growing up and dealing with emotions and feelings, it is complicated no matter who we are. And what I do when I ask that question, we've literally had thousands of students say, when I saw all those hands get raised, it helped me understand that I'm not alone. And I show the students or the adults or anybody in that venue, you see the hands raised by default, by people feeling alone. It lets you know that even though you feel alone, it doesn't mean you're really alone because people feel just like you. But we won't know that because sometimes we isolate and we protect and we don't communicate. You see, I dealt with all of these issues as well as having thoughts of giving up, as well as dealing with self-injury and self-harm. I have scars on my hands. I've also recognized, and we all know it, we can use the word bullying. 
I like to call it for what it really is. It's verbal, mental, emotional abuse, and ultimately what it is, there are people that wear the mask and they suppress their hurts and their pains, and instead of having thoughts of giving up, instead of dealing with self-injury and self-harm, some of us, we cope different with the hurts and the suppressions. We look in the mirror and we want to belong. There's nothing wrong with that, but we've learned to come to school and we've learned to go to our workforce and we've learned to deal with people this way. We try to take our worth and take our value and step on people and hide behind our words and hide behind our fists because hurting people hurt people. And what I always try to inspire those hurting people to know, you can't take your worth and you can't take your value and you can step on me and you can clown on me and you can get your friends and your peers and your community to laugh at your jokes and you act like you don't care. But when all that stripped away and you're by yourself and you look in the mirror, you still don't feel what you're trying to try to take because you can't take your worth and your value. And you may make fun of me, but I'll go on to college or I'll go on for the rest of my week and I will forget about you one day, but you're stuck with you. You're walking wounded. And the the challenge is, if we can get hurting people to get to the root, why do I treat people the way I treat them? You see, when we wear the mask and we suppress the social and the emotional, it comes out in all these destructive ways. It comes out with suicidal ideologies, and it comes out in self-injury. It comes out with hurting people, hurting people. And for others, yet again, it finds a new way to surface. For me... When I was in school, besides having ideologies of ending my life and self-injury and me hiding behind my words and my fists, peer pressure is a real thing of fitting in, trying to maintain images, maintain images. And for me, there would be students that, hey, Nathan, pop the pill, take the drink, smoke this, try that. And I was like, nope, I'm never going to because I'm going to prove to my dad that I don't need him. But eventually peer pressure is real because we want to belong. At the end of the day, even when we wear the mask and we suppress, we really, we get into this, this really difficult situation because most of us, we put on the mask because of an abuse, because of a trauma, because of an experience that's been difficult for us to navigate. And even though we want to belong as a kid, we desire to want to be a part of friends and circles and crowds and people, but we go through things and we get rewarded wired to protect but even though we're rewired to protect young and old alike there's still that core base piece of you that desires to belong and for some of us we start eventually turning to drugs and to alcohol we start turning to substance abuse if it's a pill if it's subscription pills if it's alcohol if it's weed if it's cocaine if it's an opiate whatever it is for some of us we get put into situations where others are doing it and even though we know sometimes we shouldn't we've heard about the dangers of it sometimes we get to a place where we compromise ourselves because at the end of the day we just want to feel like we're a part of something and for me The pressure got to me in school, and I got to a place where I compromised myself. I gave in to the pressure, and it seemed innocent. I popped the pill. I took the drink. I tried the Valium. I tried the Xanax. I sorted the line. You name it, I was right there in the middle because at the beginning of it all, it seemed innocent. It's what you do in high school. We're just having a good time. And probably many of my adults in here, you remember what high school was like. I'm sure none of you have ever experienced any of that. But there's this this culture and this society of what school's supposed to be like. And when you give in to the pressure, even though it seems innocent at the beginning, for many of us now, we've been wearing the mask, and even though we gave in to the pressure because we wanted to fit in, we were trying to maintain an image, we wanted to feel like we're a part of something, and when we started getting high and faded and twisted, the hurts and the pains behind the mask, when I would get high and faded and twisted, It made that stuff go away, it seemed, for the moment, and it became my new coping mechanism. And I tell groups when I talk about substance abuse, drugs and alcohol, when you first begin, it may seem innocent. It's like a cute little bear cub. Rawr, bear cub. Really, bear cubs are cute. They're cuddly. They seem so innocent. A baby brand new bear cub, (laughs) I can't hurt you. The problem is when you begin to feed the bear cub, and the bear cub grows up, the full-grown grizzly bear, it won't be cute. 
and it won't be cuddly, it won't respect you, even though you play with it and you were feeding it as a bear cub and it seemed pretty harmless, as it matures, its instincts will kick in and it will do one thing, it will try to kill you. Drugs and alcohol are the same way. See, I gave in to all of that and I wanted to belong, I wanted to fit in, but ultimately that storm of peer pressure met the storm of my mask and my inability to communicate and to speak up. And when those two fronts mixed and met, that tornado was developed. I went from straight A's to straight F's. I went from being a young man who had the world by the palm of his hands to being a young man who literally skipped school 60 to 63 times my senior year. This picture on your left, that's me at 18 years old. I'm a heartbeat away from a drug overdose. You name it, I've attempted it, I've tried it. If it's an opiate, if it's the prescription pill, if it's the alcohol, if it's cocaine, if it was any of those things, I began to find myself getting caught because when you start to feed the bear cub, it may seem innocent, but it begins to lure you in. And what's amazing and dangerous and challenging about that cute little cuddly bear cub I say amazing because you won't even see it coming. When you go to the national parks, they tell you what? Don't feed the bears. Why? Because if you begin to feed the bears, the bear begins to think that you're a food source. And if you don't have food to feed it, and if you don't are, have the ability to feed when the bear begins to think that you will meet its substance, it can kill you. Addiction is the same way. You will start to steal, to compromise. You will start to make choices and decisions and do things that you never thought that you would do because the addiction, it gets so gripping, it gets so real. See, drugs and alcohol, this is, this is the journey. And now all of those places, thoughts of giving up and self-injury and self-harm and suicide and, and hurting people, bullies, verbal, mental, emotional abuse are drugs and alcohol. All these places come, for the most part, from this core of us wearing a mask and being afraid to take it off and to be vulnerable and transparent. All of these, the root of many of these, they come from our fear to speak up and to speak out. Because I don't know how others will think. I don't know what others will say. I care so much about the perception of what people think about me. For me, this was my life. And ultimately, that wasn't rock bottom for me. As I got kicked out of school, and as my life spiraled out of control, I went to the army at 18 years old. I couldn't quite do that right. I found myself kicked out of the army after a year. I was a great soldier, but I couldn't quite resist the, the drugs, and so I failed a lot of drug screens. I got an other than honorable discharge, I came home and I lived with my grandfather. My drugs though, again, when you feed the bear, the bear begins to think that you're a food source and you'll do things that you never thought that you would. I ended up stealing $4,000 from my grandfather at 19 years old when he was having open heart surgery for my drug addiction. My grandfather, he pressed charges to try to teach me a lesson. I was charged with 17 felony thefts and 17 felony forgeries. My grandfather stepped in though because he knew the prosecutor and he tried just to teach me a lesson and they gave me a slap on the wrist. He was constantly, my parents and my grandparents, well my mother and my grandparents, they were always trying to speak up, to speak out, to reach out. But ultimately, I still wasn't at that place yet. At 23, when I should have been a senior graduating college, I was living in my hometown of Marion, Indiana, to where I was born and raised. It was a Friday night, a bunch of my friends went out to a party, I went with them. When we left the party, we went to the bar, we went to the bar, I had 10 more shots of tequila, I was extremely inebriated. When we went to leave the bar to go to an after party, my friend said, Nathan, we're gonna go to TJ's. You know TJ well, why don't you, why don't you leave a little bit early and go get him? And go, and go to the party and get the, and, get the, and get the party ready for the after party. So I got on the phone and I called my friend Priscilla. She came to pick me up to be my designated driver. When she came to get me though, when we left that night, for some reason when we got to her car, even though she was my designated driver and I was extremely inebriated, when we left there that night, I had gotten the keys to her vehicle. And we left that night. 
and we didn't make it to TJ's house. We hit a tree at a high rate of speed. My friend Priscilla Owens, on July 17, 2009, she lost her life. We were involved in a terrible accident. We hit a tree at a high rate of speed. I woke up in a hospital, police officers over top of me asking me questions. They didn't know who she was because her cell phone, it was locked. Her ID, it wasn't in her purse. And she was fighting to survive and they needed to know who she was until they couldn't identify her until I woke up. And when I woke up, my mom was to my left in the corner and my ankle was throbbing and I said, her name's Priscilla, what's happening? And they said, Mr. Harmon, we can't tell you too much. You're not family. But Priscilla, she's alive, but she's struggling. And for some reason in that moment, they didn't arrest me. I don't know why. Maybe because my ankle was broken. The police didn't want to pay for the hospital bill. I don't know. Or maybe they didn't know how to charge me with a crime of a DUI or a DUI with bodily injury. But what I do know is they let me go that morning, that Saturday morning on the next day. And as I got into the car with my mother, my mom said, Nathan, your life's about to change. And I said, what was happening? What's going on? My sister was a nurse. And when the accident happened, she got the phone call. And when she showed up to the hospital, I had already been lifelined out. But she read the police report and she read the ambulance report. And the police report said that the amount of impact that we hit the tree, there was no brake marks, no skin marks, no signs of me trying to stop. Just boom. We were going 60 to 63 miles an hour. And upon impact, my hand snapped the steering column and my foot was on the gas pedal and it shattered my ankle. But the case of beer that we put in the back seat, it was catapulted forward. And Priscilla was in the front seat and she didn't have her seatbelt on. And the beer bottles on Priscilla flew through the air. And they hit the windshield at the same time. And my friend Priscilla, she lost her life. Now get something very clear tonight. I take 120% ownership of this. My friend Priscilla Owens is not here because of my choices. And choices matter. But what happened in the story, it's pretty insane and it's not normal, natural, or practical. But three days after my wreck, her family wanted me to contact them what do you say? I'm sorry. Forgive me. I was terrified. Not only now have my choices destroyed my life, but they had affected another family forever. And I pick up the phone and what do you say? Forgive me. And I call and nobody answers and I didn't want to call back, but I knew that I had to. And I call back and Carolyn, the mother and Olivia, the sister answer. And they say, Nathan, and I said, I'm sorry, I have no idea. And I had no words and I'm crying and, I'm, and I'm, I'm afraid and I'm embarrassed and I'm sad and that there's really nothing that you can say. You should hate me and I get it. My life, it's whatever. And they said, Nathan, we don't know what happened that night. Our daughter left to be your designated driver. I said, I know. I have no idea how I got the keys. And they said, we know our daughter. She was a pistol. She was not easily influenced. She was strong-willed. We don't know why she would give you those keys. I said, I have no idea either. They said, we're angry. We're mad. We're sad. We don't know how to feel. But what we do feel as a family, we personally, in this moment, we don't think that one dumb choice should have destroyed two families' lives. Our daughter, just as much as you knew better, she knew better. I said, no, it's my fault. They said, yes, you're responsible. But we as a family don't think we can hold you solely responsible. And in this moment, even though we don't know how we feel, we do know what we're choosing to pick love over hate. And we want you to know in this moment we're choosing to forgive you. But we're asking you to do two things. First off, we honestly, we forgive you. We want you to be part of our family, even though we don't know you. But we're asking you, please don't let our daughter die for nothing and try to make the world a better place. Choices, though, have consequences. And even though the family shows this love that's radical, 
My mom doesn't even say Nathan. And my mom, if I was honest, she's one of the most God-fearing women in the history of mankind. She's like four foot 11. She's like next to nothing. And she said, Nathan, if somebody had taken your life or your sister's life, I would probably demand justice and judgment. And that's natural and that's normal. But this family, they chose love over hate. But again, choices have consequences. The state of Indiana, they didn't forgive me. In the state of Indiana, I was charged at 23 years old when I should have been a senior graduating college. I was charged with reckless homicide and I was sentenced to 15 years in prison. But in that moment and in that place, when I went to prison, honestly, it would have been easy for me to throw in the towel to say I quit, I give up. It would have been easy to say, you know what, my life's a mistake, I'm a failure, I made too many poor choices, and now my choices haven't only affected me, but they have affected another family. But honestly, I remember a quote that my father, when I was a young man, he used to always say to me, and he always said, as long as there's breath in your lungs, there's hope in your heart, and giving up's not an option. When I was a kid, and he would beat the brakes off of me at any sporting event, he used to always tell me, identify the problem, solve the problem, giving up is not an answer and it was in that place instead of saying you know what I've made too many mistakes I'm a failure suicidal thoughts self-injury hurting people with my choices and my actions and my fists and my anger and my rage the drug addiction I had been homeless at times from the ages of 18 to 23 sleeping under these bushes of Walmarts it would have been real easy to say I give up but it was in that moment I realized something that I had to take control of my life and what I've learned and what I share with was schools and venues anywhere I go that it's this that as long as there's breath in your lungs there is hope in your heart and you are not a product of your environment. You're not a product of the storms you face. You were a product of how you navigate your storms. You're a product of how you navigate your environment. What you do matters. Choices matter. But I had to realize something that the mask that I had wore for so many years from the sixth grade all the way up to 23 years old, this mask that I thought was supposed to protect me, it was the very thing that was holding me hostage. This mask that I thought was supposed to keep me safe Honestly, it isolated me, and I had all these these situations and these habits that I created that were destructive, and I realized that I had to take off the mask in 2009 and 2010 and begin to face my fears. I had to begin to be vulnerable and transparent. The mask, apparently, it didn't work. It was pretty common sense to see that. Now I'm 23, and I'm facing 15 years in prison, and my choices had affected another family. And so it was in that moment that I took off this mask But I realized there were some fears and some also adversity that I had to challenge myself because if this family could choose love over hate for the loss of their daughter, there was a lot of abuses and traumas that I had experienced as a kid that I had to let go to. You see, I used to blame my dad for everything when I was growing up. When he was removed from my life, he became my excuse. He was the reason for my poor choices. He was the reason for my drug addiction. He was the reason that I skipped school. He was the reason I hid behind my fists. I blamed him for everything. And I realized one of the habits that many of us have walked and developed and we didn't need to as we've grown up, I was allowing things that I couldn't control to control me. I was allowing situations that I didn't ask for, that I didn't sign up for. I had no pardon, like broken families and abuses and how people have treated me. I was allowing those things to control me. And I had to learn that I had to take control of what I can control. And I can't control what you think about me. And I can't control what you say to me. And I can't control how you treat me. But I can always control how I react, how I respond, and what I do. And if this family could choose love over hate, I realized that a lot of my anger and my rage that I had to the abuses and the traumas that I had faced as a youth, it wasn't poisoning anybody else, that hate, that rage, that anger. It wasn't afflicting anybody else except one person. It was poisoning me. Because no one's going to care more about the quality of your life more than you. Every one of you in here, 
You were born to leave your fingerprints on history. Every one of you in here were born to be better, to achieve better, to have better. We are better together, but at the end of the day, some of us, we have developed these characteristics where we're allowing things that we can't control to control us. And it was in that moment when I took off my mask and I faced my fear that I realized I had to let some things go. And I never let them go for a long time because I thought if I let them go, it justified what they did to me. I thought if I let it go, it was okay. And I was, I was admitting that it was no big deal. No, just because you let things go and just because you choose love over hate and you choose to not let the bitterness poison you as a person, it doesn't justify it. It doesn't make what they did to you okay, but it allows you to begin to live. And that's challenging though, because you have to face your fears. Because most of us, when we are in that place and we wore the mask, our trust has been broken and we don't trust people. And yes, we know that we need to trust people, but it's like, man, I know I should and I need to and I want to, but I don't know how to and I'm waiting for the perfect person. When that perfect person comes that I can trust, then I will begin to step out there. I have news for you. That person, it's not there. There is no perfect person that you can trust because people are people and we will let you down and we will upset you and we at times will fail you. And I had to learn that I couldn't wait for the perfect person and I just had to do it afraid. I had to begin to step out into the unknown and punch that fear directly in its face. I had to be vulnerable and transparent I always say it this way now, I had to skydive that thing. And here's what I mean by that. You see, I've always wanted to skydive. It was always a bucket list thing that I've always wanted to do. It's always been something that I've wanted to do. And many of you, let me just ask the question, young and old alike, how many of you in here do you sometimes struggle with trusting people? Anybody in here battle with trust? Anybody in here? Lots of us do. And at the end of the day, most of us want to trust people, but there's a fear because we don't know what you will do with what we share, so we don't. And we continue to stay in this place of isolation. Remember, when we began, we all want to belong, but we go through things, trust gets broken, abuses and traumas happen, and we get rewired to protect. And the only way that you can circumvent and overcome that place is that you've got to punch this fear of trusting people in the mouth. You gotta skydive that thing. And here's what I mean. I've always wanted to skydive. Like many of you said that I, I struggle with trusting people, but you really wanna trust people? You see, skydiving, well, it's a bucket list. I wanted to do it. And um, so now in my journey, as I communicate and I travel, I'm a father and I'm a husband. And I guess the responsible thing to do is not to jump out of planes. And so I never thought that I was gonna get a skydive ever again. Like I never did it before, so I, it's ever again, but I just thought that that was a dream that was kind of gone. But I was in Oregon earlier this year, and actually in the fall of 19, and this, we got done speaking, and I was going to go zip lining because there's a cool mountain, but the zip line course was closed. But I saw a sign that said, skydive Oregon. So I was like, huh, let me follow pro pro procedure. Let me call my wife. <laughs> and so I call her, and I'm like, hey, honey, I was going to go uh, zip lining, but the zip line course is closed. And um, like, you know, uh, there's a skydive. I think I'm going to skydive. No, I'm not going to skydive. Well, maybe I'm going to skydive. I was like, you know, testing the water, but I wasn't really serious. I didn't think she would ever say yes. And I think she was just being like the good wife that didn't want to control her husband. And she was like, oh, son, go, go for it, honey. No big deal. Go skydive. And I said, no, no, I'm kidding. I'm just joking. And I hung up. But then I was like, wait a minute. She just said Yes. So 20 minutes later, I called her, and dude, I was strapped up with a suit on, ready to rock and roll. Her eyes got big. I hung up. I ain't giving her time to say no. She done said yes. I went through the process of skydiving. The instructor shows up. I'll be honest, he was a hippie, dude. Dreads in Oregon, probably a stoner, just being real. It's legal there, I guess, whatever. And I'm like, you're my, yep, he said, I'm an instructor. He said, this is my seventh time. I said, seven, this is your, is that legal? You're jumping eight times out of the plane today? Have you packed all your shoots? Yep, we're good. Or did you make a mistake? Like, how many times are we going to test this thing? He's like, oh, it's good, man. So I start going through the process of skydiving. He shows me how to lay on this little bench in the fall. He shows me how they pack the shoots. Like, I've always wanted to skydive. 
The plane lands. I get in. We take off. This dude with his dreads, he slides up behind me. We're jumping tandem. He said, listen, bro, we're climbing up to 15,000 feet. Before we get there, we got six connectors. I'm going to hit all six. I'm going to give you the sign three times. You know we're good to go. Whoa. I'm like, oh, my gosh. Dude, my anxiety, it's getting up there. My fear, it's getting up there. I've always wanted to do this, though. We get to 13,000 feet. He rolls up the cargo door. He said, listen, the fall's only going to be about 40 seconds, but I want you to get the full experience. So for the next three minutes, as we climb the next 2,000 feet, we're going to slide to the door. I'm going to hold on, and I want you to hang there. And I'm like, no! <laughs> and he said, no, no, no. I wanted to go even one step farther. I want you to take both of your feet and touch the bottom of the plane. And I'm like, no! And when we got to 15,000 feet, and it was time to go, I've never been more terrified in my life. The safest place that I could have been in the moment was in that plane. But I had never been more terrified. And I was at the doorway, at the precipice of something that I've always desired to do, I longed for. It was a bucket list, and I was terrified. But when I trusted the process and I took the next step in faith and I punched that fear directly in the mouth and we went, I've never felt more alive in my life. As I freed fall from 15,000 feet and I saw Mount St. Helens and Mount Hood and Mount Rainier, I was on top of the world. I had to skydive that thing. And for some of you, you have these fears and you have these traumas and you have these situations that you know these things that you want to talk about and you want to open up to and you want to begin to address and you get right to the very precipice. You get right to the door at 15,000 feet and you desire, you long for it, but you're uncomfortable and you're terrified. I'm here to tell you it's always going to be uncomfortable. Change takes change. Facing your fears, it's challenging, but you need to trust the process And that's why we're better together. We're not supposed to do this on our own. We've got to skydive that thing. And I've learned when I started trusting the process of trusting people, not not putting my confidence in you because you're going to let me down, but putting my confidence that in the act of trusting and communicating and being a part of a community that can support me, that I could find real freedom. In prison, when I begin to face these challenges and I begin to take off my mask and I begin to skydive that thing and begin to speak up and to speak out and to trust and to communicate, I develop five habits of my life that changed my life. I call them five habits of the heart and the mind that's changed everything. Transparency, accountability, hard work, make good choices, and value people. Transparency, accountability, hard work, make good choices, and value people. I learned that transparency, I had to take off my mask. I had to begin to speak up and to speak out with the people in my circle. I'm not saying any random stranger, but I had to find the courage to skydive my fear of my lack of trust and do it afraid. And I had to get to the place where I began to speak up and to show my social, my emotional, my mental, and my physical scars and be vulnerable and be transparent. And I've never found more freedom in my life because as I start sharing with these people, And and yeah, we had anxiety, and yeah, we had these fears, but you know where anxiety comes from? We start what-ifing the outcomes. If I do this, this will happen, and if I do that, this will happen, and what if this happens, and what if that happens? And we start creating this scenario, and we haven't taken one step, and that anxiety, it gets real, and it becomes becomes like it's physical, and it paralyzes you. I had to learn to stop what-ifing everything and just do it afraid. Because it never turns out as bad as what you think it's going to be. See, that's where anxiety lives when you have all these unhealthy expectations that you put on scenario after scenario and you let the fear paralyze you. You gotta skydive that thing. And when I began to open up and to speak up and to speak out and be transparent and vulnerable, you know what I realized? The people that I shared with, they had issues too and they found the courage to talk back with me. And they found courage 
to be vulnerable because I was being vulnerable. And what I've learned that every person, every single person in this community, in this state, in this country, on this planet, I don't care what you project, I don't care what you portray, I'm talking about all of you in here. I don't care what image you want to always project out there. Every one of you are just like me. We are beautifully broken somehow, some way. We've all got stuff. And the more that we begin to find the courage to show our social, emotional scars with each other, we inspire each other that it's okay to not be okay. And it's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to let our friends stay that way. And the way that we lead by an example is being vulnerable. I get asked all the time, Nathan, how do you get people to take off your mask? How do you get students to be vulnerable and transparent? I always say this because I take my mask off first. And I'm vulnerable and I'm transparent and I don't care what you think about me and I will share you my hurts, my mistakes, my failures and I will be open and vulnerable because my worth, my identity, it doesn't come from what you think about me. I don't care if you see me as flawed or scarred because I know deep down just as much as I'm beautifully broken, so are you too. We've all got stuff. And vulnerability and transparency, it changed my life. And transparency, it led me into a place of accountability. They go together, transparency and accountability. Because as I begin to speak up and to share with the people around me, people that are holding me accountable, they're not there to change me, they can't change me. But what they can do is they can be an anchor in my life. Because many of us want to change, we need to change, we would like to change, but you know what? Nothing ever changes. You know why nothing changes? Because change is uncomfortable. So a lot of us, we run back to being what we've always been. And I've learned the more that we use each other and we're better together, the people in my circle, they hold me like an anchor. They can't make me change. But when I have those emotions that are fight or flight, survival of the fittest, even though I want to change, I want to run because emotions are complicated and they feel uncomfortable. They hold me as an anchor like my skydiving structure behind me and they help me get to a place where I skydive that thing. Vulnerability and transparency has changed my life. You know, I'm 11 years free from every addiction. I'm 11 years free from every alcoholism. I'm 11 years free from every suicidal thought and my eating disorders of bulimia. I'm 11 years free from my attitude where I used to hide behind my words and my fists. I'm 11 years free from so many destructive behaviors because I've learned that community is everything. Vulnerability is freedom. And even though we've got issues and we've suppressed those things, we are better together. Transparency, accountability, hard work, make good choices, value people. For me, what happened, even though I was being vulnerable and transparent and I was developing healthy habits of my heart, being able to navigate my social and my emotional struggles by being in a community, I still had to realize hard work works. Make good choices, good things happen. There's never a wrong time to do what's right. See, I always tell students, honestly, in the last three years, I've been in over uh, 750, however many schools, over a million students that I've communicated with. I, I could say by per sheer number, I'm the leading voice of youth, mental health, and substance abuse in schools worldwide by the per capita of people that I've encountered. And you can quote me on this. The world is lazy and I say phenomenal. And here's why. Because everybody talks about it. Everybody posts about it. But not too many people will roll up their sleeves and just try. And what that means, because the world's lazy, if every one of us in here will just apply and try, it doesn't matter where we come from or where we don't come from, what we have or what we don't have, by default, because everybody talks about it, but nobody moves, if you will just apply, try, and give effort, you will separate yourself from the crowd. Hard work works. There's never a wrong time to do what's right. In my story, Indiana, they started a program. I didn't know about it, but I was going through my skydiving, the thing of transparency and vulnerability. Indiana started a program. They wanted to take an offender, and when they took the offender, they were going to send him all across the state of Indiana. And in that moment, I didn't know they were, who they were going to select. I was just working on me. But again, good choices, they position you in life to win. And so when they pick somebody, who do they select? I got selected. 
for two years, I traveled all across the state of Indiana and I spoke to over 7,000 community members in D1 colleges and high schools and conferences and festivals and gatherings small and large in two years into me leaving the prison in street clothes and then going back to the prison. Two years into that, the governor of Indiana, who happened to be Mike Pence at the time, they wrote a letter that this young man is more effective out there than he is in here. And I walked out of that prison 11 years early. Why? Because hard work and good choices position you in life to win. And you are never, no matter what your storm, no matter what your struggle, no matter what your unique situation is in this place, you are not a product of your environment or your storm or my prison walls, but we are a product of how we navigate our storms. Transparency, accountability, hard work, good choices, and value people. I got released 11 years early. I reached out to one school, even though when I began, everybody in my hometown said, you're an idiot, you're a failure, you're never gonna change. I used to get offended at that, but I, this time I realized they had a right to feel that way. Talk's cheap. I had given them plenty of evidence in the past to think that this was another one of Nathan's little cool stories, how I'm gonna change my life and nothing changed. So in this place, in this moment, I decided that my life, it would speak, it would scream, it would shout, your Life speaks. And we reached out to my first school. And in 2020, as I sit and I stand in Marshfield High School, in front of all my community friends and family in this room tonight, I promise you, transparency, accountability, hard work, make good choices, and value people, it works. Human connection is what we desire. Being vulnerable is what we need. We've got to find the courage to skydive that thing. Dr. Whitman from Cornell, when I interviewed her this year for the documentary that comes out at the end of, this, at the, end of the spring, beginning of summer, hopefully, the producers are working on getting it to the film festivals for the fall, for the, for the summer. But Dr. Whitman said, Nathan, I have full confidence we're gonna figure this thing out. But our youth, our youth are the canaries in the coal mine. And our youth are struggling right now. And that lets all of us know that it's time for us to be very intentional of building relationships and being vulnerable as adults and being transparent and taking off our masks first. Tonight, guys, I'm confident that we're gonna figure this out. I'm confident that we're gonna overcome this struggle, but it's going to take all of us as community members to continue to be open, to be honest, to be intentional, to work together. And for all of us in here, that you know you're wearing the mask, I promise you, it's not what you think it is. It's not gonna keep you safe. It's holding you hostage. And I've learned, this needs to be quiet. I've, it, or maybe it's telling me to shut up, one or the other. I've learned that we're better together. I've learned that no one's an island. We need each other. And we've got to be intentional. Human connection is at the root of all of this. And we as adults, we have to lead by being vulnerable. I always tell parents, they ask me, Nathan, how do I be vulnerable? How do I be transparent? I'm always saying, I need you to go to the very edge with your kids, with your loved ones, when you feel like, am I sharing too much? Am I took it too far? And I want you to take it one more step. See, I can't tell you how to parent, I never would. That's your own unique set of people that you've been entrusted with, and that's a wild concept. Again, I go back to the beginning. Raising children is crazy. But what I do know is that the more we're vulnerable and transparent, the better we can help our youth develop perseverance and develop resiliency that we can't take for granted that they have because again, 
we're on the first generation of something that we've never had to deal with before. This has changed things. But it's okay. It's just going to take time of us being intentional, of us understanding your life. It speaks, it screams, it shouts. When you skydive that thing, others will find courage to skydive that thing too. And if you're struggling, and if you know somebody who's struggling, friends don't let friends to continue to struggle. It's okay to not be okay, but it's not okay to stay that way and let your friend remain that way. We've got to understand that you are more than your struggle and your friends are more than your, their struggle. And if you see someone struggling, best friends don't turn the blind eye. You encourage them, you inspire them to get help. And if they won't get help, they're not your best friends because they have to like you. They're your best friend because you will do whatever it takes to keep them alive. And I don't care how mad they get at you, if you gotta speak up and speak out for them, eventually they'll look back one day and they'll be grateful that you stepped in and you spoke up and you became their voice when they couldn't find the courage to. It's an honor to be part of your community. It's an honor to give life with you, to live life with you. And tonight, as we gather, as we, 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 we came, we set, hopefully we get empowered, hopefully we can process, hopefully we can grow. If there's any questions tonight, we have a few minutes, I would love to answer a few of those. We have a podcast we, we release every Sunday night at 6 p.m. on Spotify, Apple, and Google. It's with me and Dr. Doug Miller. Dr. Doug's a psychologist from Durango, Colorado. This is the logo that you would see if you look on Spotify, Apple, or Google. Dr. Doug's a psychologist. I'm an idiot with experience. It's a great relationship. <laughs> there's about 30 some episodes up. We're real, we're raw. There's, there's great pieces for us to continue to grow on there. We drop tons of video on all of our social media platforms to inspire, to encourage, and all of our stuff's called Your Life Speaks. We're releasing our first book called The Five, Transparency, Accountability, Hard Work, Good Choices, and Value People, later this, this spring, beginning of summer. Our documentary will come out, but more than any of those resources, here in this community, I've got to live life with a lot of community members, a lot of social workers, a lot of administrators of school systems. This is a community that cares. And we've got to be intentional. And we've got to work together. And eventually, we're going to figure this out. But that's why we've got to be alert. And we've got to be all hands on deck. Because our youth, they're the children and the, they're the canaries in the coal mine. And that just means that we can see that they're struggling. We heard the numbers this morning or this afternoon, one in four, we're in here. But I believe as long as there's breath in our lungs, there's hope in our heart, we're better together. Thank you guys so much.